Oh, thank you. Um, and I apologize in advance because this has got quite a lot in it. I'm going to do this quite formally, so beg, beg, beg your pardon about that. It's not, uh, it's not just like a talk. It's, um, uh, it, it's uh, something I'm going to have to read out. So I'll start with that. And uh, you probably won't see much of me from now on because I'm going to go to the slides at this point. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm calling this talk an open conspiracy. That's a term from Raymond Williams. We'll come to that later. Uh, and uh, I'll get to cultural science, but I need to take a, 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 a certain path to get there. Uh, and that path is through the domain of consumer-created content. If consumer-created content is a new reality for the new media industries themselves, then what does this mean for media and cultural studies? I'm arguing that the field is overdue for a consumer makeover. For too long, we have been dominated by top-down, ideologically motivated and structurally rigid political economy approaches that have preserved the media effects paradigm, i.e. what media do to audiences, well beyond its use by date. In studies of media industries, too much attention has been paid to providers and firms, too little to consumers and markets. But with, uh, with user-created content, the question first posed more than a generation ago by the uses and gratifications method and taken up by semiotics and the active audience tradition, i.e. what do audiences do with media, has resurfaced with renewed force. So what's new is, that where, this quest, uh, what's new is, where, this quest, is that where this question of what the media industries and audiences do with each other, uh, it used to be an individualist and functionalist uh, uh, question. Now, with the ad advent of social networks using Web 2.0, uh, it can be reposed at the level of systems and populations as well. There's also new hope for integrating the study of economic and cultural systems and processes, which historically have been addressed by different academic disciplines. Now, there's a chance to bring together, perhaps for the first time in a thoroughgoing way, the political economy and the text audience traditions to unify the study of economic and cultural values in the process of uh, formation and change. Um, so this is where we get started. The um, industriousness of amateur creative users suggests that self-made media content has already disrupted the expert paradigm that dominated media production during the broadcast era. Is this a portent for the industry in general and for industries in general? If so, then the YouTube generation is modeling the future of innovation and growth across the economy and beyond into cultural and community contexts. In that case, media industry studies would provide a general public service if it were to devote itself to understanding emergent systems and values, both cultural and economic. If it focused on analyzing the process uh, and dynamics of change directly. Such changes are leading the field beyond the study of media power towards that of the growth of knowledge. And that's my main contention. So we can all go to the party now if you'd really like to. However, there does remain a strong whiff of ideological standoff in much work on media industries. The pro-business spookers of innovation like Beinhocker or Charlie Leadbeater versus the anti-capitalist skeptics like um, Nick Garnham, uh, the Schillers, uh, and probably quite a few of you. Continuing problems carry, on, uh, carry through from the industrial or expert paradigm uh, to, consumer or social, to the consumer or social network paradigm, and new problems demand urgent attention. These include both monopolistic tendencies, i.e. one supplier of content, and monopsonic tendencies, i.e. one buyer of labor, among the existing and new media corporations, and the growing use of free labor, the work put in by consumers and users, as well as the conditions of employment in media industries. This is uh, the, the territory of uh, people like uh, Tiziana Terranova and so on. Nevertheless, such problems are not well understood using a technology of critique, as it were, that is based on industry. So, the problem lies not with the laudable effort to study industries, but with the term industry itself. In common with language in general, the social sciences and humanities share a long history of borrowing metaphors from other domains to identify and describe their own object of study. Industry is one such term. 
However, like other metaphors of organizational scale, for example, capitalism, society, culture, globalization, the name itself does not describe any necessary empirical fact on the ground. You can't put your toe on an industry. Uh, you can't stub your toe on an industry. Perhaps this is why in economics, a discipline that does have ambitions towards scientific and mathematical uh, status, industry is a derived term and not a natural category. In microeconomic theory, industries do not exist. What exists are agents, prices, commodities, firms, transactions, markets, organizations, technologies, and institutions. These are economically real at the level of any individual agents, transformations, or transactions. I'm quoting from Jason Potts there, who's an evolutionary economist. Firms then produce goods or services while industries are abstract aggregations of firms, of actions, and of prices and the rest. Industry is often used even more loosely, interchangeably with business, trade, market, or even community, as in, do you work in the industry? <clears throat> this doesn't mean that the term is um, <coughs> excuse me, useless or a lie. It means that it must be used with care, carrying with it a full trail of analytical explanation. But instead, media studies imported the term as self-evident and as real, with connotations that endowed vertically integ integrated industrial corporations not only with moral qualities, chiefly evil, but also with exorbitant or fabulous powers, as Ian Connell pointed out a generation ago, back in 1984. As a result, the industry, that is the media, is frequently described as having properties it cannot possess, for instance, consciousness, which in turn are soon personalized into barons, moguls, and, ass and assorted bets noir, Hearst, Berlusconi, Murdoch, Citizen Kane, stage villain. In general, the metaphor of industrial scale agency carries with it connotations of power, control, hidden agendas, the objectification of the consumer or audience, often provoking moralistic or ideological misgivings about wealth creation as such. Now, industry is a modern term. Uh, Pre-modern and traditional societies didn't have a word for it. It's borrowed from the Latin for diligence, of the kind frequently attributed to ants, hence my lovely slide that I'm sure you've been enjoying. It originated in early modern English in the 1500s to describe individual action, actions, intelligent or clever working, um, skill, ingenuity, dexterity, or cleverness in doing anything. In the 19th century, this term was applied metaphorically to large-scale systematic productive work and manufacturing. Uh, as in captains of industry or an industrialist, and in the 20th century it was applied metaphorically again to any profitable practice. And the Oxford English, English Dictionary lists the Shakespeare industry, the abortion industry, uh, or the, industri in the industrialization of a country. So this extrapolation from individual studied di diligence to industrial revolution and thence to organized exploitation brought with it a model of a system. Industry henceforth required more than individual industriousness. Um, the system couldn't work without these elements. Spare money, uh, that's Stanley Dubon's term for capital. Specialization or the division of labor. Coal and steam, which are new sources of energy. Railways and Reuters, i.e. faster communications. The cotton jenny, uh, meaning technology and machinery. Manufacturers and cities, uh, that one's Birmingham. Uh, the uh, proletariat, i.e. an organized and disciplined labor force. And uh, the proletariat's wives and families, that is, increasingly affluent consumers. Individual craftsmen were reduced to labor, their value to that of hands. Work was changed from being handiwork to repetitive routines, as satirized by <coughs> Charlie Chaplin. The 20th century was marked by continuing ideological adversarialism, class war in intellectual as well as industrial life. And so the concept of industry as a system never traveled far without this baggage. It was just such a vision of industrialization that was in the minds of those intellectuals, critics, and sociologists who attempted what was called the, uh, to, who contemplated what was called the consciousness industry or the industrialization of the mind. These are Enzensberger's terms or the manufacture of consent, which is the Hermann Chomsky title. Industrialization and manufacture then of consciousness. When it came to the media, therefore, it was almost inevitable that industry meant not studied diligence, 
in the production and dissemination of meaningful representations, but organized exploitation on a society-wide scale using bias, manipulation, and ideology rather than creativity, innovation, and dialogue. But most of what goes on in the media industries, as in any other service, is not captured by the industrial idea of the production of goods. This is another extended metaphor. Media content is not a good. Consumption is not what audiences do. Consumption is, of course, a pre-industrial agricultural metaphor appropriate to foodstuffs that are literally consumed. Cultural goods or symbolic goods like music, screen narratives or printed stories remain alive for indefinite reconsumption. Furthermore, indus the industry label is not accurate for small or micro businesses that um, drive the creation of novel content. Uh, many, um, uh, uh, many performers and freelancers are more like itinerant traders than industrialists. Terra Nova dubs this the open source movement. Uh, I'm sorry, dubs the open source movement uh, internet tinkers. They operate in a market where the real consumer to date has been none other than the pre-internet monopsonic media industries. Musicians, in other words, sell to record label, labels, music, movie makers to film distributors, TV producers to networks. Creatives are organized into a market that services giant corporations. One result of this is a persistent tendency among the general public to treat creative IP as a public good, uh, resulting in um, the still far from settled struggles over copyright, DRM, file sharing and all that. So the constellation of small independent traders selling creative services and content to distributors is often named after the district whose market is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, is often named after the district where the market is clustered. So we have uh, those kinds of places signifying certain kinds of media activity. Hollywood, Tin Pan Alley, Wardour Street, Fleet Street, Silicon Valley and so on. Actually, therefore, getting the general public to believe that there is such a thing as the media industry, say in the form of Hollywood, which is a derivative entity having no real existence as such, by continuously imagining or imaging or inventing it in the textual form of news, previews, gossip, branding and the like, this takes a fair amount of corporate marketing and government effort, as John Caldwell has uh, noted, of course. With Web 2.0, more people are asking whether creativity itself and also entrepreneurship are well served by filtering consumer demand through such lumbering metaphors or whether it might be possible to reconfigure the relationship between producer and consumer on more equal terms. So in practice, that means reinventing the market, which is what is going on now. And that brings me to the creative industries. Uh, it can be argued that the creative industries are the empirical form taken by innovation uh, in advanced knowledge-based economies. Uh, and so I do argue, in which case their importance, like that of the media industry, exceeds their scale as a sector of the economy. Uh, it extends to their role as what I'm calling a general enabling social technology. This would place creative innovation on a par with other enabling social technologies, for example, the law, science or markets where the media uh, were regarded as the, the, the media in the broadcast era this is the cultural industries where these were regarded as the social technology of ideological control in the industrial era the creative industries may be regarded as the social technology of distributed innovation in the era of knowledge-based complex systems in each case, their value is far greater than their scale as an industry sector as such. So just as it's not common to assess the importance of the law or of science by counting the number of employees in these occupations, so it's unwise to confine analysis of media and creative industries to their particular scale in the overall, uh, overall economic pie chart. Enabling social as opposed to physical technologies uh, provide the framework for the growth of knowledge in general, media and creative innovation play a key role in this process. However, such a role for creativity was not clear from the outset. Uh, creative industries uh, idea has uh, had to evolve in practice, which is what that um, slide is supposed to signify. Uh, you've got about 200 years there up on the screen. But unlike biological evolution, uh, uh, however, like the evolution of culture, earlier forms uh, in an evolutionary process do not suffer extinction. 
They're supplemented rather than supplanted by their successors. So co-presence uh, is a characteristic of um, cultural evolution. Co-presence, however, can be ordered dynamically along the lines proposed by Raymond Williams for culture itself, which, as you know, he saw as both ordinary, that is population-wide, not high culture, and as a whole way of life, that is a system, not a value. So um, Raymond Williams's dynamic schema, his way of ordering co-present forms of culture, was residual, dominant, and emergent culture. Quite simple, but very helpful. And it gives us this. <clears throat> um, there are models, economic and policy models, that um, correspond with, uh, uh, with culture understood as residual, dominant, or emergent. So creative industries can be ordered using this schema. Thus, creative industries as art, this generates a net, this is Throsby, for those of you who do economics, the, uh, this generates a negative economic model. Uh, here, creativity is, a, is seen as a domain of market failure. Art requires subject, uh, subsidy from the rest of the economy. And, this, and the policy response is, therefore, what we call a welfare model. This uh, is Williams's residual dynamic of culture. Creative industries as media industry, in other words, the old-fashioned old industrial cultural industries, this generates a neutral economic model. Media industries require no special poly att policy attention other than a competition policy, and so this corresponds to dominant culture. And then thirdly, creative industries as knowledge uh, in, in both market and culture, uh, this generates a positive or an emergent economic model. Here the creative industries are indeed a special case because they can be seen as the locus for evolutionary growth or uh, at, the fuzzy, at the fuzzy boundary between cultural social networks and economic enterprise, uh, where markets can play a crucial role in coordinating the adoption and retention of novelty as knowledge. They require growth and innovation policy, and this corresponds to emergent culture or, uh, in, in um, Williams's terms. So the positive or emergent models of creative economy have only recently been identified and theorized, and they're not yet properly crunched in terms of st statistical testing. Um, thus, the growth and innovation policy responses themselves remain for the time being an emergent approach to the place and significance of creative innovation in a social to totality characterized by growth, dynamism, change, and technologically enabled networks on a global scale. If this approach is on the right track, however, it shows that the very term industry is bound to a rapidly obsolescing paradigm, which is associated with a particular economic model and policy response, neither of which is appropriate for current circumstances. So here, instead of industry, a better term is market, in which agents with considerable freedom of choice or flexibility of action make a deal in which something is exchanged money, attention, connectivity, ideas, for mutual benefit. Now, I've talked about co-present dynamics of um, culture over uh, historical periods and an emergent or generative edge for creative innovation. Uh, but in that context, uh, we also see a re very rapid evolution through time of the creative industries concept itself. So I'm now moving on to, uh, this is meant to be a time-based um, uh, time chart, uh, r rapidly accelerating towards the end. <laughs> the, the first category is you know, like a couple of hundred years, and the last three categories are the last 10 years. So it's an exponential curve, if you think of it that way, time-wise. So the creative industries, uh, the last three of those categories there, the creative industries uh, can be divided into three phases. Phase one was where they were first mapped by the UK government's Department of Culture, Media and Sport, DCMS. Uh, in this first phase, attention was focused on the term industry itself. This is where we get the problem from, uh, referring to firms whose outputs were construed as creative. Uh, there has been a continuing disagreement about what should be included, arising from problems of scale, for example, global corporations and sole traders in the same category, 
of coherence, what is the unity of product among different creative industries, of scope, uh, the potential arbitrariness about what's included and excluded, a uh, particular problem with IT there that Toby's interested in, economic impact, uh, that is creativity is dispersed across economic sectors, regions and occupations is very hard to count. And finally, the tendency to neglect the productive role of consumers, users and non-market agencies. But rather than solving these problems conceptually, um, policymakers plumped for what was then a very uh, um, uh, popular theory, Michael Porter's cluster theory, seeking to identify things like creative quarters, as, as Simon Rudhaus does, uh, 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 a uh, process that's been um, roundly criticized by uh, Kate Oakley. Um, and um, these cultural quarters were found especially in deindustrializing cities that were developing from centers of production to centers of consumption, moving from industry to tourism, for example. It's also argued that the creative industries were growing faster than other sectors, claiming extra dynamism for those associated with digital technologies. So, for example, by 2020, we're told this sector will be worth $6.1 trillion. Uh, that's the kind of figure that gets banded about. So creative industries, one, is, is industry-based, has IP outputs, and results in creative clusters. Creative industries, two, uh, is where attention widened from creative outputs to the economy as a whole in order to identify the extent to which creative inputs were adding value to firms not otherwise regarded as creative, especially in the services sector. For example, government, health, education, tourism, financial services, and so on. Creative disciplines such as design, performance, production, and writing add value to such services, often quite spectacularly. However, it's hard to isolate and quantify the value added, not least because of the way in which industry-based economic statistics are collected. Recent estimates suggest that one-third of those in creative occupations are embedded in other sectors, however. So it could be that the creative economy is at least a third larger than the creative industries, is the implication of that. So creative industries too, which is where we are now, we move from industry to market, from IP outputs to creative inputs, from creative clusters to creative services. Creative industries three, which is uh, emergent, uh, is um, convergent with the extension of digital media into popular culture. The rise of the, this is the rise of the so-called user-created content, which has drawn attention to the extent to which innovation, change, and growth is attributable not to firms alone, but to socially networked consumers and uh, enterprises of various kinds, communities, and to non-market activities or scenes that, ex that escape traditional economic categories entirely. This phase challenges the closed industrial system of professional expertise, favoring instead the growth of complex open networks in which creative IP is shared rather than controlled. Okay, that's the evolution of the creative industries. Um, and I think I should have been doing this all the way through that. Um, so there we are. That's number two. That's number three. You got all that, didn't you? Uh, and now we move on to the next phase, which is social network markets. Sorry, I'm, I'm, you know, it's early in the morning here. Give me a break. Okay, social network markets. The evolution of the creative industries does allow us to make a significant conceptual advance, one based on evolutionary economics and taking seriously the dynamics of change and innovation, the emergence of order in complex systems, and the possibility that both economic and cultural behavior may be explained using things like game theory and complexity theory. In this environment, the ob uh, which, by the way, uh, uh, originates entirely outside of the humanities, uh, the, 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 the object of the exercise is to understand the origination, adoption, and retention of knowledge, not simply to critique the activities of firms. Indeed, focusing on industry has been part of the problem. A better term than industry is market, specifically social network markets. For one thing, this shifts causal sequence from a supply-driven to a demand-driven dynamic. A demand-led model of creative citizen navigators requires a reformulation of the familiar value chain approach to um, creative, uh, yes, this is the right slide, <laughs> uh, to creative, um, uh, to cultural production, which typically, uh, this is the value chain approach, typically follows a one-way logic uh, based on 
Claude Shannon's original uh, model of communication, you know, the uh, sender-receiver model, a one-way model of uh, causation, like um, uh, as you see at the top of the screen there, uh, producer or creator uh, and, and production or manufacturer at the top, which then causes the form of the commodity and uh, controls its distribution. And then you, at the end, you have the audience, which uh, has very little left to do but to um, be exploited. But, so instead, what's needed is what you see at the bottom. Uh, you need a model of agents, networks, and enterprise corresponding to origination, adoption, and retention. Agents may be individuals or firms. They're characterized by choice, decision-making, and learning. Networks are both real, that is social networks, and virtual, that is digital networks. And enterprise uh, are market-based organizations and coordinating institutions. But enterprise may uh, be uh, um, conducted by both individuals and organizations, like firms. But they, uh, enterprise may also occur outside of uh, market environments, too. So those three terms uh, uh, cover more than the old producer-consumer uh, model. And instead of linear causation, what's needed is a dynamic and productive interrelationship among agents, networks, and enterprise. Uh, all are engaged in mutual enterprise of creating value, both symbolic and economic. So this is a complex open system in which everyone is an active agent, not a closed expert value chain controlled by industry. Individuals originate ideas, networks adopt them, enterprises retain them. And so I'm arguing that this is the concept of the creative industries or the creative economy, creative culture as a social network market. The special property of social network markets is that individual choices are determined by the choices of others within the network. This is not a difficult concept to grasp. Essentially, it's Richard Lanham's uh, economics of attention. A social network market is at work wherever you read a review or heed word of mouth before trying a film or a restaurant. Um, it operates when you value fashion over intrinsic worth. In other words, where the need of the... Um, Consumer is based on status rather than other kinds of needs. And it explains celebrity culture. Tastes and identities are formed on the basis of the choices of others. Of course, it underlines the aggregator, uh, uh, it, uh, it, I'm sorry, it underlines aggregator social network enterprises such as Facebook and uh, MySpace, uh, YouTube and even Amazon, all of which operate by networking individual choices in order to guide the choices of others. And there you have uh, people uh, organizing themselves into social networks that are seeking to, um, uh, cash, uh, seeking to um, purchase, seeking to consume uh, uh, based on the choices of others. Uh, two rather different but rather similar uh, models of uh, social network markets. Okay, social networks are valuable adaptive mechanisms for dealing with uncertainty, risk, and novelty at the macro scale of populations and systems, even while they're driven by micro scale individual choices. That's what's interesting about them. They occupy the border between established markets, that is the economy, and non-market dynamics, that is culture, especially via Web 2.0 applications and creative expression. And they work both ways, just as individual consumers decide on this basis what to do or where or even be, so, consu so producers respond to the choices of others in deciding where to invest, uh, which of course explains the sequel industry. Uh, and neither agents nor enterprise discriminate between producers and consumers, which is of crucial importance in the fast-growing area of user-created content, of consumer-led innovation and self-made media. People can make enterprises out of enthusiasms. One minute you're a fan, the next you're signing autographs. Okay. Uh, this section is called the growth of knowledge. Is this a future for media industry studies? Looking to the future, it's worth asking. Um, you can bring me back. Looking to the future, it's worth asking whether the uh, recent mass propagation of creative digi digital literacy is part of an emerging social network market uh, as part of those, I'm sorry, 
uh, may be enabling further evolutionary step changes in the growth of knowledge. Ordinary people, people formerly known as the audience, passive and uneconomic, need to be able to access social network markets both as agents and as enterprises to share their own expertise and to develop new network expertise, uh, the collective intelligence or wisdom of crowds idea, such that they too, as well as professional experts, contribute to the growth of knowledge. This ability needs to be propagated via population-wide education, both formal and informal, uh, that is based on schools and entertainment, uh, and accounted for in, uh, in economic modeling. It requires that consumer-created content is seen as more than mere self-expression and communication or leisure entertainment. Digital literacy can generate new forms of objective description and argumentation. Uh, these are Popper's terms. New forms of journalism and new works of the imagination in which individual consumers are agents in networks not subjects spiked on the end of advertisers' hypodermic communications. Their individual and collective agency is productive of human knowledge, not simply of corporate takings. Now, of course, all this is already happening, but it's not well integrated into models of mediated communication or policy settings on, creative, uh, uh, on the creative economy, which are still too much tied to an industry versus art uh, uh, type of um, um, setup rather than to integrated knowledge. So instead of ideological standoff, consumer led innovation uh, needs to be understood coherently as an emergent knowledge in uh, as emergent knowledge in a complex open system, even while commercialized experiential self expression, for instance, via consumer games, looks at first sight like the very opposite of knowledge as we've known it up until now. That is seen from the perspective of print based modernity. If pushed beyond an adolescent look at me stage, digital literacy can assist not only in self expression and communication, but also in the development of knowledge as an open innovation network. Consumer created content is an excellent means for recruiting new participants into that adaptive framework and for lifting general levels of digital literacy and popular expertise. It may be modeling for the coming century the role, if not the methods, of public schooling in the earlier period of print literacy. And we go back to this. So the development of social network markets and user-created content should not be seen as an end in itself, uh, as if knowledge of the personal is all that's necessary for people outside of existing professional elites. It's no advance to reinforce the bar to barriers between popular culture and expert culture, uh, science for producers and self for consumers, or worse still, truth for the experts. That's um, Isaac Newton, by the way, uh, signifying truth there. Um, uh, and Stephen Colbert's truthiness for the audience, which is a, a distinction that uh, one does come across. The second, the consequences of doing that are already part of the crisis confronting contemporary societies. People feel cut off from expert systems, including both science and entertainment, and are more skeptical than ever, than ever about objective knowledge, whether it's presented as science or as news. Not only are the claims and, produ and products of scientific research often, often rejected or delayed in the court of public opinion, GM foods, nuclear energy, weapons of mass destruction, climate change, bioscience, but even the modern commitment to rationality and the open society in general are undermined from within by resurgent religiosity, including New Age spiritualism, the me culture and the moralizing politics of fear. So the need is not to separate science or description and argumentation from popular culture as self-expression and communication, uh, not to separate them further from one another, but to invest in holding them together. This is something that creative social networks and social network markets can do as long as creative digital literacy is propagated on a population wide basis. The shift from broadcast to interactive media has begun to democratize the publication of self expression. This is already complicating the entire edifice of representation in both symbolic and political communication because people can now represent themselves via self made media. They are no longer satisfied with, uh, with deferring to professional representatives. They want direct vo voice, action, creative expression, and increasingly, knowledge. Creative industries are the generative engine 
of such emergent knowledge. Um, okay, we move on to uh, if the history of print literacy is anything to go by, democratizing digital literacy will unleash presently unthought of innovations. These may be as remarkable over time as have been the products of print realism, which include, think about it, uh, what, was the, what, what, what was the product of prints uh, of print? Well, it wasn't just books. It was also science, which can't exist without print, the novel, uh, a whole area of um, uh, imaginative expression that um, uh, uh, democratized and feminized uh, the imagination, and journalism, the real in politics. Uh, none of these could have, uh, have uh, been established without print. So it's important to include within any, within any account of creative innovation the emergent means for growth within the system as, as a whole uh, and, the possible un, and the possibility of unforeseen consequences of developing the system. These now include rather than exclude the general public, many of whom are already joining the life of science by contributing directly to the evolution of knowledge. Among the many examples might be the Wikipedia and its variants, oral history on the web, including digital storytelling, photographic archiving on Flickr, Google Sky, where you can zoom for your house, from your house to the universe, SETI, which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, computer games for problem solving. Uh, there's one called World Without Oil that you might know about. Uh, and critical discussion of science versus create, creationism, which you can find being conducted with great uh, intensity, passion, and intelligence on YouTube. The long tail means that there are infinitely more examples. What is rarely done in critical media industry studies is to take these seriously uh, as part of democratized digital media and population-wide social network markets. The next stage in the evolution of creative industries is to return the concept to the place where it began. Uh, creative industriousness, evenly available among the human population, but this time coordinated, scaled, and technologically enabled in such a way that social networks can harness the creative imagination of all the agents in the system, which itself is used for growing knowledge as well as for self-expression and uh, entertainment. Industry policy, therefore, ought to be directed towards the propagation of digital literacy and participation and not remain narrowly focused on firms uh, and um, economic services. Now, I'm going to move on to the bit that brought you here, I suppose. Uh, so a question that remains on the, uh, on the future of the media industries is this. What achievements will be enabled? by the combination of creative industries, social network markets, mediated, mediated entertainment, and universal digital literacy. That strikes me as being a good, uh, a good uh, uh, prospectus for uh, studying what used to be called media industries. But there's also another problem, which is how do we find out uh, the answer to such questions? What achievements will be enabled? Well, uh, a good question is how to find out. I think the main thing holding cultural studies back at the moment is its limited ambition, amounting sometimes to defeatism of its own practitioners, who excel at in-close micro-analysis of local specificity without reaching for an adequate macro level of conceptualization to replace the long dominant but now largely abandoned Marxist framework. Given the incredible energy and productivity of popular culture itself, this failure to develop a concerted strategy of theory formation and conceptual framework development to understand how media, popular sense-making, and global commercial enterprise are affecting the growth of knowledge, this is damaging. The productivity of popular culture, of open digital literacy among non-specialist agents and enterprises, is now such that it demands a more systematic response than can be a, achieved by maintaining a struggle stance towards culture pushing at the police line, as it were, uh, uh, without purposeful objectives beyond enjoying the experience with like-minded others, which is possibly what we're doing right now. The failure to think systematically seems to result in part from the capture of cultural studies by culture wars partisanship, where ideologies and values have become more important than description and theorization. Such partisanship is quite understandable, when neocons stalk the corridors and, of power and the airwaves, uh, in Washington at least, but it makes for poor science. 
Cultural studies has become most strongly established, in other words, at the values end of the disciplinary spectrum, the polar opposite of the quantitative sciences. It's becoming the secular successor, successor to that branch of clerical training concerned with sermonizing, using rhetoric, textual exegesis, and moral precepts to guide the young in public values, personal comportment, and a vision of ethical living. This is a long way from science, even as modified by the creative destruction of complexity and cultural studies. And I'm thinking of um, the analysis of Richard E. Lee here. Uh, and even, the most progressive, even if the most progressive definitions, um, uh, 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 definitions are used, uh, for instance, that the word science describes contested knowledge, we still don't do it. In cultural studies, we have too much contestation and not enough knowledge. It is hard to co contribute to the process of self-correcting knowledge, which is another good definition of science, without engaging in it directly, i.e. by self-correcting the knowledge of the cultural studies domain itself. Strangely enough, this is exactly where cultural studies came in. Richard Hoggart himself saw the need for his own field, modernist literary criticism, to engage with the social sciences. This was the project of the early days of the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Studies at the University of Birmingham. He sought the, the input of sociologist Alan Shuttleworth, who presented a paper on, and I quote, Max Weber and the Cultural Sciences. This was the stenciled occasional paper number two, the first written by Hoggart himself, of CCCS. It is, in fact, the founding document of the Birmingham project. This theme was later picked up by that other pioneer of cultural studies, Raymond Williams. In 1973, he made a speech to the Council for National Academic Awards, which is the body in the UK charged with the modernization of higher, higher education curriculum via what was then the new polytechnics. Uh, the polytechnics were a good idea uh, and just beginning to show what a good idea they were when they were abolished, so we don't have polytechnics anymore. Um, but their degree courses and schemes were validated by this body called the CNAA. Williams used the occasion to propose something new, a risky enterprise, as he knew only too well from working in the old humanities. He said this, and I quote, you can go on doing, in effect without challenge, virtually anything that has ever been done. But if you propose anything new, you are lucky if your integrity escapes a whipping, your intelligence and sensibility will have been long given up as dead, which is, of course, the story of my career. Undaunted, Williams went on. The approach he said I want to describe is that of cultural studies, which is English for cultural science. He borrowed the term itself from continental sociology after Weber and Dilthey. It is worth noting here that the binary split between arts and sciences that bedevils Anglophone disciplines is unknown in European languages, where the human sciences are part of science, because science refers to knowledge in general and not only to white coat experimentation. What attracted uh, Williams to cultural science was its practitioner's openness. And he, says, he said this, um, I'm, I recall the spirit of cultural science uh, because I'm interested in its heirs, who will change its methods but will still inherit its vigorous and general humanity. The work will be done because I think there are now enough of us who want the, to work in these ways to survive the defenses of special interests, the general drizzle of discouragement, and even the more deeply rooted inertia of contemporary orthodox culture, to announce, in effect, an open conspiracy that, in new ways, by trial and error, but always openly and publicly, we shall do this work because it needs to be done. That's Williams. Well, an open conspiracy among thousands of peoples, people and their heirs who, systematically in theory but by trial and error in practice and in a spirit of vigorous and general humanity, seek to study the relations between different practices, this is the prolegomena for us cultural science still, even though the project has been updated and refined to study evolutionary change in practices and not just their structural relations. So the need for cultural studies to return to uh, its, science, its cultural science roots is the more urgent because, risks, uh, because it risks being overtaken of, 
In other words, we risk, cultural studies risks being displaced and supplanted. A long-term trend can be observed in which disciplines once located in the humanities have drifted ever more firmly into the mathematical sciences, starting with mathematics itself, of course. Uh, biology, once called natural history, geography, economics, and psychology, to name a few. Some of these, especially psychology and neuroscience, are becoming ever more confident about explaining culture. So too are the evolutionary sciences, game theory, complexity theory, evolutionary theory. Indeed, it is evolution, uh, the adaptation of complex systems to change that can bring the humanities and audiences, I'm sorry, and sciences back together. In particular, evolutionary economics together with cultural, science, uh, cultural studies and the creative industries. The cutting edge of research on creativity lies in the triangulation of these three domains. Creativity, complexity, and creative innovation. So creativity can be understood as reflexive adaptation to unpredictable change within complex systems. Good definition of creativity, if you're interested. Complexity studies explain how social network markets are vital enabling technologies for the distribution of choice. And evolutionary theory focuses on the dynamics of change and the growth of knowledge. Cultural science identifies patterns of action in complex social networks their past evolution and possible future scenarios, including paying attention to unintended consequences of choices at any given moment. Some of that work must involve mathematical modeling, computational research power, large scale data collection, and much greater attention to robust empirical methodology that has been evident, uh, than has been evident to date. All of these developments can assist those coming from the humanities, including cultural studies, ethnography, and the creative arts, to rethink creativity as a property of agency in dynamic systems. But there will be pain for some. Practitioners of cultural science must engage with another kind of digital literacy, namely mathematics. As the pioneer of artificial intelligence, John McCarthy, one of your favorite people, I'm sure, uh, says in his tagline, he who refuses to do arithmetic is doomed to talk nonsense. Harsh, but increasingly true, even for those who work in the humanities. So reflexive creativity is what enables human culture to adapt and change, a process that, despite some mass extinctions throughout the millennia, has resulted in an exponential growth in knowledge and in the, in the creation of new values, both economic and cultural. Culture can no longer be seen as the preserve of artists, it is made up of the activities and productivity of the millions who interact in social networks uh, that are now dispersed among whole populations. With the growing ubiquity of digital media, these are becoming a more dynamic source of productivity than industrial innovation as such. And it is here that we will find the most important uses of digital media. The social network Fort Swarm outperforms the IP protected lab and at twice the speed. One of the best examples, um, that's interesting. Um, that's a power law ratio. Uh, that's a good, isn't it? Uh, we should talk about that. Uh, one of the best examples of how that sort of innovation works in science, it's, uh, uh, one of how that sort of innovation works is in science itself. Astronomers and physicists use digital networks to increase their s the scale and speed of their own calculations. But the same model works in fashion, where constant innovation is equally imperative and a complex social network market determines individual choices in a culture that relishes risk. Such systems can be analyzed using both in-close contextual techniques from the humanities and computational power to map social networks of choice and change in the way that people perform their cultural identity and relationships with themselves and with others a process that's well, under, uh, one, well underway in internet and network studies. Theory building is also vital to model how such actions are patterned in complex adaptive systems and how agents and enterprises navigate those systems. And I'm going to conclude by saying this. Some of the most important problems in this context are clustered around participation and consumer productivity. At, an, at a time when industrial age expertise competes with population-wide access and use. 
From this perspective, the creative industries and new digital media can be seen as a kind of creative wrecking ball or creative destruction or experimental laboratory of the world in relation to existing models of both economic growth and cultural participation. Those of us working in cultural science are convinced that the creative destruction of some well-established knowledge paradigms is overdue in both economic and cultural analysis and should form an, an important focus for research, both empirical and theory forming, over the coming years. Some challenging ideas are already in place. For instance, the Santa, Fe's uh, the Santa Fe Institute's attempts to produce a computational science of society and one of their um, leading lights uh, definition of culture is Scott Page, who calls uh, culture suboptimal behavior. Um, we might be able to do better than that. We hope to establish principles and directions for future research in the field of cultural and economic values, leading to a new cultural science. The empirical focus is on the shift from closed expert process, i.e. Pro professional dis production in vertically integrated firms, and structural analysis to, to, uh, to an open innovation system and complex adaptive networks. For example, investigating social network markets. So the fundamental problem to be addressed is how knowledge is evolving in a dynamic and complex open system that unifies the economic and cultural spheres and harnesses the energy of all the agents in the system, both individuals and enterprises. That is what user creative con created content and population wide digital literacy is for, even if that is not yet its principal use. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions there, one about uh, the role of economics in the humanities and the second one about uh, the relations among big media and um, uh, uh, individual creative enterprise, if I may put it that way. Uh, the, the, um, oh, and of course, the problem of Hartley's optimism uh, uh, which I've uh, maintained through thick and thin uh, uh, for v very many years now, uh, partly because I think it's the moral duty of people to be optimistic about futures that um, the people they're teaching are going to have to live in, whether they like it or not. You, know, you, you cannot teach councils of despair, I don't think. Uh, so I think, I think optimism is just a function of teaching, in, in other words, that's what I'm saying. Um, so going to the first one, I think there has been a standoff uh, between economic discourse and um, uh, particularly cultural, but also humanities discourse over many years. It's been impossible to have a good dialogue with the economists. And that's because the economists are wrong. And um, the, the, uh, the problem has been that they've been working to the equilibrium model of the economy and uh, they've turned economics into a mathematical science, which is very esoteric and which requires a certain kind of training to get into. And it's only since the development of um, what's called heterodox ec economics, but in particular evolutionary economics, where, where the uh, analysis has moved away from uh, the um, uh, uh, investigation of equilibrium and the models based upon that, that uh, idea to the investigation of change, that, there has been, that it has been possible to have a proper dialogue between cultural studies and uh, economics. And that's because cultural studies itself is a, is a discourse for the study of change. And so uh, my, my optimism about this possibility is that for, uh, for the first time in my career, uh, th th there seems to be a real uh, intellectual engagement at the fundamental level uh, between two uh, rather um, dis distinct uh, domains of knowledge that have previously found it impossible to uh, talk to each other. So I do think there's something to be done there, but it's based on the idea of dynamic systems rather than on equilibrium economics. Turning to your second question, can I put the, um, yes. No, uh, that, ah, there it is. Can you see that thing? The space saucer, whatever it is. Um, that is the answer to your second question. Uh, because it's a power law distribution curve, as you know, and um, the thing in the middle is big media, and the thing at the edge is you and me. So w my answer to your question is that, of course, the big media won't go away just because I've started talking about social network markets. Uh, however, what's really important is not to see big media and ordinary participation as an adversarial system or a structural opposition or an antagonistic relation. On the contrary, it's, it's important to see these things in... Uh, in systematic terms as part of one system, a system which has very varied uh, um, um, 
uh, very varied uh, participants in it, if I can put it that way, um, so that you've got the, uh, the, the, the extreme... Um, uh, uh, the, the, the extremes at one end of big media where you have enormous numbers of uh, uh, consumers, users or viewers per individual item and at the other end uh, the opposite where you have um, you know, more writers than readers as it were. And then clusters and coordinating mechanisms and uh, navigating agents and turbulence all the way through. Those are those funny little circles all the way around. These are the ideas of hubs and nodes that come from uh, you know, Barabas's network theory and all that, uh, which uh, need investigating. Is, is, is it true that uh, uh, systems are self-organizing, that they are coordinated among hubs and nodes, that you can observe these regularities of relationship among very large-scale uh, um, uh, activities and very small-scale activities in the same domain? That actually strikes me as being an empirical question. And it's one that the, uh, the, the scientists in um, um, complexity th studies are already beginning to apply, I think, you, to, um, to um, culture. That's my answer. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm glad you started with the uh, concept of, or the, uh, the phrase, uh, market imaginary, um, because the, uh, um, there's all sorts of things going on in this room. You should see what's going on around us. Um, the, <laughs> I'll press on, because the, uh, the thing I would like to introduce into our area of study is much more attention to the concept of the market and to get away from the idea of industries. So that's, that's a, 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 a kind of basic idea that um, uh, underlies what I'm trying to say. And I think the, the market often is uh, um, singularized in that way. It's called the market. Uh, it is an imaginary. Uh, people in, impute just as many fabulous powers to markets as they do to industries. And um, um, I don't know if you can hear the building works, but they're coming closer. Uh, the, um, the, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, I, I can now, I can now hear you. Um, one of the things I... No, no I, I, I'll press on um, through, through, the, through the drill noises. Uh, okay, so uh, the, 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 the point I'm trying to get to is that we need to uh, deconstruct, if that's the right word, the actual idea of the market and look at what kinds of markets might be of interest to us because not every market is... Uh, something that we would want to oppose on principle. For example, most of what goes on in popular culture around, uh, you know, uh, people's identity through music is conducted through markets, and people are relatively comfortable with the mechanisms that have been set up uh, in that context. So, you know, I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to reify markets, and I don't want to dismiss them. I want to analyse how they work, and uh, uh, the. Um, uh, the particular uh, strategies by which deals can be made, which are of benefit to both parties to the deal, rather than simply a model of industrial exploitation. So I'm very glad to introduce the concept of market and have it immediately challenged. That's the whole idea. Uh, it's uh, it's a, a, a concept that needs uh, unpacking and analysis. Uh, your questions then. The first one was about, remind me, Ah, yes. Yes, okay. Uh, I don't think that at all. In fact, the whole point of my um, intervention is to say that much of what is innovative and of generative edge in innovation, which is what I'm interested in, doesn't come from the market. It comes from non-market uh, communities of interest, for example, and uh, from systems that have been set up, possibly by scientists or academics, possibly by ordinary folk. Uh, but very often well to the side of what we would recognize as a, as a market under current circumstances. And the economics of innovation has been stymied, I think, by not taking account of uh, the uh, activities, agencies, inventiveness, and all the rest of it, of both individuals out there beyond the market and of uh, non-market uh, organizations of various kinds. 
So, I mean, the obvious thing to say here is that the World Wide Web was invented in a non-market environment. And then uh, what, uh, what firms do uh, is to uh, 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 take the generative edge, the idea, and uh, coordinate activities that can lead to adoption and retention of certain forms uh, of what presumably once was, but is now no longer innovation. So I see, uh, I see the generative edge of creativity as being a non-market, external to the market activity, and I see the market as the mechanism for adoption and retention of innovations. Uh, so that's, that's what I'd say about that. Uh, I see the social, in other words, as encompassing the market and not vice versa. And then finally, you, made, uh, you had a question about technology. Uh, I have very, very mixed feelings, very uh, complicated feelings about technology, because again, it depends what you mean. Uh, and I don't see that technology does erase difference of uh, various kinds, uh, least of all of the cultural, ethnic, sexual, uh, age-based, and all the other uh, identity-based uh, notions of difference that you mentioned. Um, on the contrary, I think technology is always in the service of the, either the reproduction or the, uh, or the um, uh, bridging of those differences. So uh, I don't have an answer to you about uh, the use of technology because I don't see technology as being neutral. Uh, however, uh, I do think that there are moments when technologies uh, kind of catch fire, as it were, and uh, uh, I do think that, for example, the invention of writing and the invention of printing were uh, it technolo technological innovations uh, of, a, uh, of an order quite different from you know, general everyday life. And it does seem to me that new interactive digital technologies are of that order in the long history of the growth of knowledge. So it's not that they're neutral. It is that there's something happening right now over our lifetimes which, is, uh, which has not happened, for example, during the broadcast era and did not happen during the, uh, the, the period since the invention of print. And that is a whole new uh, uh, system of communicative possibility out of which knowledge can grow in ways not hitherto foreseen. Uh, well, there's a lot left out, that's for sure, uh, because uh, I don't know very much, uh, but uh, um, the, uh, the other stories, the stories of colonialism and globalization of trade and uh, of uh, different kinds of national history or uh, even national, nation, uh, nation formation, uh, in, in different contexts. All of these are very much part of what I'm interested in. And certainly I'm not pretending to be um, uh, either an expert in those or, or, uh, or leaving them out of account. Uh, I, I, I thought I spoke for rather a long time anyway. Uh, so, uh, you know, what isn't in the um, talk is not necessarily uh, devalued for that reason. It's just that I, I felt that I was being asked to talk about uh, something specific. So I did. Um, so the, uh, the, the, um, I, I'm drawn to saying uh, uh, that I wish I'd um, introduced my talk with the work of Giovanni Arrighi because the, uh, the, the, the analysis of world systems uh, as a, a, a product of both Enlightenment philosophy and of imperialist trade strikes me as being absolutely the right way to think about the issues that you raise, but also they encompass a great deal of the kind of work that I'm interested in pursuing. So uh, I don't think there's a millimeter between us on the importance of these issues and the need to incorporate them. Uh, I, I, uh, I guess I just have to plead ignorance about uh, going into it in any great detail. Having said all that, uh, I do want to say I, uh, th that I have um, quite active relations with uh, one so-called developing country that is de decolonizing itself at a rate of knots, and that's China. Uh, and there the, the uh, shift from um, state-directed command bureaucracy to uh, so, uh, something like uh, a, a um, dynamic market economy um, is, uh, uh, is of, uh, obviously uh, huge significance to the kind of work that I'm interested in, partly because when I first went to China, the idea of the creative industries was not understood at all. Uh, they were very interested in large-scale cult uh, cultural industries, which is a term they still use. Still use. Um, and, um, yeah, that was very loud. <laughs> 
and um, <laughs> you should hear it, you should hear it in the headphones. Um, the <laughs> it's it's nothing like the uh, noise that we're getting off off uh, uh, screen here. Um, the um, okay, so I just want to say that in relation to China, uh, there is a, a, a very strong dialectic, as it were, between the importation of Western ideas, foreign ideas, market ideas, capitalist ideas, on the one hand, and on the other hand, both the need for uh, some uh, um, maintenance of centralized control and a, a strongly resurgent. Uh, uh, cultural nationalism about uh, the, the role of China in history. And I assume that that is true for any domain, any country, any region in which these issues are alive. So I'm not trying to, um, to put them out of account. Uh, it's just that I think that the, uh, that the system in which those people are uh, active is global and uh, is something that um, people on both sides of uh, the colonial divide, if that's what it is, or the colonial connection, which is what it really is, uh, 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 have to take account of. So I think, I, think, I think it's an analytical problem rather than a philosophical one that we have here. Uh, well, David, I've read your work on the uh, need for the humanities to be taken more seriously in the American uh, policy domain, and I agree with every word of it. Uh, and also, I didn't know that I was a technicist. I, I, I don't understand that term at all in relation to me. I'm what uh, Toby calls a semiotic romantic. And uh, uh, the... Um, uh, and... And although I leave the romantic for others to judge, I'm certainly interested in semiotic systems. And those I understand to be rooted completely in the humanities. So just to answer you very briefly, I would say that I get my model of a complex system from Yuri Lopman uh, and uh, not from technology. However, I do think that the mathematical sciences and network theory are available to understand the way in which language is produced and exchanged and uh, embedded in various cultural practices in ways that haven't been open to us in the past. So I think what I'm trying to argue for is not a reduction or, a, or an evacuation of the humanities, but a precisely an, a, a, a bringing of our fascination with the production and circulation of meaning to uh, a point where we can investigate it empirically. When I started writing uh, far too long ago, uh, I was interested in the historical development of the reading public. Now, the reading public is always an imaginary object because you don't know who's reading what and how they're interacting with each other. But now you do. So it is now possible to investigate not just the production of meaning, but its circulation, uptake, reproduction, and uh, whatever, the unintended consequences, uh, in, in, uh, in ways which were not possible before. So I guess I'm, uh, I'm trying to evade your question by saying it wasn't me, Gov. Uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it, it was somebody else. And uh, in fact, I'm, I am simply seeking to... Uh, um, uh, immortalize the humanities work of Yuri Lopman. <laughs>